Hello everyone, Professor Immler here. Today we're going to be talking about categorical syllogisms. Uh, in this video, we are going to cover what they are and how to recognize what we call their forms. So we are literally going to be talking about how to categorize categorical syllogisms. Okay, so let's get started. A categorical syllogism is a three-line argument composed of categorical statements. Now, so far in this class, we've only had to keep track of statements with two categories, the subject class and the predicate class, which we have represented with S and P. With that, we've been able to deal with and evaluate those immediate reference arguments, those two line arguments that only have those two classes. But in order to engage categorical syllogisms, we're going to need a broader language, more terms, more categories to help us conceptualize what's going on and to standardize our terms so that we can analyze these things. So first, let's talk about some terms of the categorical syllogism, particularly the major, minor, and middle terms. Let's start by looking at an example. Here you see this three-line argument. You can see that we're dealing with categories, right? Books, cans, things that are recyclable. So we, now we have in this argument, notice we have three terms and each statement has varying subject and predicate terms, right? In premise one, the subject is books In premise two, it's cans in the conclusion, we're back to books. Something similar happens with the predicate of all these statements. So again, we're going to need some tools and some ways to get a hold of what's going on. Now with categorical syllogisms, instead of talking about the subject, and predicate of the argument, we use major, middle, and minor terms. The major term is found in the predicate of the conclusion. Then when we see it elsewhere, we still call it the major term. Then we have the minor term, and that is going to be the subject of the conclusion. And then finally, we have the middle term, and that is the term that is not found in the conclusion, but is distributed or found in both of the premises. Using these new terms that we have, let's identify the terms in our original argument. So the major term would be recyclable things. The subject class is books. So books is the minor term. The other term that shows up in the argument is cans. Now earlier, when we were just dealing with two terms, we just use S and P. This will not allow us to deal with the amount of terms that we find in this argument. For the major term, we still use P because it's found in the predicate of the conclusion. For the minor term, we still use S, but then the middle term we use M. Now let's move on to naming and ordering statements. We are also now, we're in a position to name the statements. First, we have the major premise, and that is the premise that has the major term in it. The minor premise will be the other one, and you'll notice that it will always have the minor term in it. And then finally, well, we have the conclusion, which is the, well, it's the conclusion. Now let's talk about the order of statements in a categorical syllogism. When we write a categorical syllogism in standard form, we have to use a particular order. So here's how that works. The major premise will always be listed first. The second premise will always be the minor premise. And then finally, well, we'll have the conclusion. Key thing here is you have to always list the major premise first. We are in a pretty good position to talk concretely about our syllogism. All right, so let's take a, a look at what the original argument was. The first thing we need to do is to reword the major premise and the conclusion. And if you remember, we have to have a quantifier, a subject term, a copula, and a predicate term. The major premise, cans are recyclable things, that does not have the, a quantifier in it. And the conclusion, books are recyclable things, it does not have a quantifier. These are both mood A statements. So we can say all cans are recyclable things. And for the conclusion, we can say all books are recyclable things. The next thing we need to do is we need to reorder the premises. If you notice in the original, the major term doesn't show up in premise one. So it's not the major premise, it's the minor premise. It has books in it. So when we're done, we will get the following. Premise one, all cans are recyclable things. Premise two, 
all books are cans. And then we have our conclusion, all books are recyclable things. Now we wanna write it in an abstract standardized form. So that means we need to use our variables P, M, and S, and then we need to make the corresponding key. And so then our argument becomes premise one, all M are P, premise two, all S are M, and then our conclusion, all S are P. And you can see in our key, S is equal to books, P is equal to recyclable things, and M is equal to cans. With these things in place, we can now talk about the form of the categorical syllogism. And there are two basic steps here. The first one is to find the mood of each statement. In our first example, notice those moods. Each one is a mood A statement. And if you remember, mood A statements have the form of all SRP. So we can write A, A, A to describe the moods of the statement major premise, minor premise, and then conclusion. So here are some other examples. If we had the collective mood of I, O, A, we would have something like some M are P, some S are not M, all S are P. And you can see how those reflect the moods. Or if we had an E, I, A syllogism, it would go no M are P, some S R M and all S R P. In the two examples I've given, the position of the terms stay the same. We've only modified the syllogism by changing the mood of the statements. In the three examples with an A A A, an I O A, and an E I A syllogism, we have the same positioning of the terms. We could, though, rearrange the terms and come up with distinct arguments. Let's see how this might work. Notice in these examples, we are keeping the moods as A and we're only changing the order of the terms within the argument. Okay, so in our first example, we have M, P, S, M, and S, P. But let's, let's change the terms position. We still have to have the major premise first, so there's always going to be a P in premise one and an M in premise one, but let's just swap them. So let's have Premise one be P and then M. And then let's also swap the order of the terms in premise two. Now the conclusion will always be S and P. If we swap these terms, we would say something in an abstract form, all P R M. For premise two, all M R S. And then for our conclusion, all S R P. And then this would correspond once we plug in our key values, Premise one would be all recyclable things are cans. Premise two would become all cans are books. And our conclusion would still be all books are recyclable things. So while we have AAA to describe our syllogism, because the terms could be rearranged, we can't just use AAA to always describe what was going on. We need to add some sort of marker for the arrangement of terms within this standardized way of writing out our categorical syllogisms. The arrangement of terms we call the figure of the categorical syllogism. And there are four possible arrangements. So we use the numbers one through four to denote which arrangement of the minor and middle and major terms are. And so you can see here we have figure one where M is in the first position in the first premise, it's in the second position in the second premise. And then we have figure two where the middle terms are both in the predicate position. Figure three, we swap it and we put the first in the subject position in our premises. That's where the middle term is. Figure four is the inverse of figure one where in the first premise, it's in the predicate position, but in the subject position in the second premise. With this in place, we can describe our syllogism as A, 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 dash one. Let's look at a couple of these forms in motion. When we have the three letters and a number to identify the structure of a categorical syllogism, we call that the form of the categorical syllogism. And we're able to refer to any of these just by those three letters and a number. Now let's look at these forms in motion. So let's just look at two, AAA-2 and OIE-4. AAA-2, let's, let's start out with the figure. A figure two syllogism has the middle term and the predicate position in both premises. So we can write it out, 
Hermes 1, PM, Hermes 2, SM, conclusion, SP. So now we have that, we have the order of terms set. Now let's turn to the moods. Each statement is in the mood A, so we know each one of them will have the following pattern, all SRP. Apply that to each of the statements and we get all PRM, all SRM, and then all SRP. And that's it. So an AAA dash two form. So that's it. A categorical syllogism with the form of AAA dash two will always result in this. Okay, now let's do O. I E dash four. Let's start out with the figure. Figure four syllogisms have the middle term in the predicate position in the first premise and in the subject position in the second premise. So we can arrange this like so. Now let's turn to each of the moods. There's a variety of moods here. And so let's write these out. Mood O will be some S are not P. Mood I, some S are P. And mood E, as you remember, no S are P. And we get the following. Some P are not M, some M are RS, no S, R, P. And that's it. O, I, E, dash four will always result in this argument written out in this way. And so using this method of demarking categorical syllogisms, we can represent in shorthand each of the 256 possible arrangements of moods and figures. And from here on out, we will use this method of naming the form of categorical syllogisms. And so this is very straightforward, but you do need to know how the rules work. Once you do, things should fit into place. In our next video, we're going to look at how we can use Venn diagrams to evaluate the validity of any given categorical syllogism. And I'll see you then.